This is a going back, remembering UGA interview with Mr. Leo Costa, conducted by Fran Lane on June 11, 2008. Today we're at the Georgia Center for Continuing Education on the University of Georgia campus in Athens, Georgia. Thank you for sitting down with us today, Mr. Costa. It's always good to be back at home. Well, and let's, that's what we want to talk about today. Let's talk about Athens. You were an Athens boy, right? Born and reared. Grew up right here and a member of the great Costa clan. It was quite, quite a large clan at the oh, time. T tell us about how many siblings? Uh, there were uh, 10 children okay. and two girls and eight boys. And they all went to work for Costas. Well, and that's what I wanted to talk about special because we've had a number of folks in our interviews refer to Costas and I know I've got a quote from Dean William Tate that said that Costas was a magic word in Athens. Talk about Costas. What did it look like? What what happened there? Oh Costas was a it was a wonderful place as far as I was concerned naturally. Um, it was in the Southern Mutual building uh, from the entrance to the building the area to the left was Costas. To the right was the CNS Bank. Uh, Costas had a cafe in there. They had a soda fountain. They had a restaurant. They had a delicatessen. And they had students enjoying a good time. All the time. And you made your own ice cream. That's what got me fired up. I'm ready for y'all to start again. Oh, I wish. <laughs> I wish. You can see how I enjoyed it. <laughs> But uh, the ice cream plant was on Washington Street. I think the police department has our building now. But it was a three-story building, and we made the ice cream from the scratch. Um, in the 30s, in the middle of the 30s, I guess it was, we rented the third floor of the building out to WTFI for the first radio station in Athens. Did you all sell ice cream beyond? Oh yes, we had uh, ice cream trucks that uh, eventually we got down to the refrigerated trucks that uh, we traveled all over North Georgia and down into Central Georgia. We even had a uh, station in Macon mm -hmm. that uh, an uncle and a brother of mine operated down there and worked out of there. They would store the ice cream there and sell it out. We need, we need more ice cream. That's my vote for the world, <laughs> more ice cream. Your banana split cost how much it cost us? I'm sure it was 20 cents. We need more ice cream. Of course, Uncle Tony used to make them for me for free. I, I'm sure. <laughs> how, how was that organized? How did the family all work together down there? Happily? Uh, that's a real good question. They put some of them out on the road selling. Uh, my Uncle Charlie and Uncle Lawrence and Uncle Fred. And uh, they used to travel around to the, you know, the various uh, drugstores and restaurants and all uh, in the area. Um, and some of them worked in the ice cream plant and some of them worked over at the cafe. So you worked your shift, huh? That's right. Of course, that was one of the downfalls of the business. There's so many families living out of one business. Right. So it's time. I, it closed in 1939. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah. From 1908 to 1939. Hmm. I saw them in the 08 uh, information. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I think that's I don't know what, what I they read. did before that, but uh, they've been in Athens for a long, long time. A, a great family known throughout the Athens area. I know that that was the gathering place for everybody, uh, high school, uh, on up probably, and that's maybe where they m met the boyfriends and the girlfriends and, and, you know, just generally it was just a great gathering place. In fact, my Aunt Martha said that that's where she found out she had a teaching job, <laughs> that, her, that she was sort of hiding after she'd finished, uh, graduated from school and she was sort of hiding there in, in Costas. And, uh, her dad, who was a doctor in that building, came mm -hmm. down looking for her <laughs> to tell her that she had gotten a job. So That's great. I know he was proud of that, too. What did downtown Athens look like in the... In the a great deal uh, like it does today, okay. except there was no parking in the middle of the street in those days. There was double parking, of course. When my mother went to town on 
any a given day, and she couldn't find a parking place in front of Michael Brothers, she went back home. That sounds right. And Michael Brothers was where the old, where Davison's was, right. and then, and is now uh, a, a building that the, actually the graduate school has an office in that building. Is that right? Is that I didn't, wasn't aware of that. What other businesses were downtown? I know. Oh, Norris Hardware. Okay. All of the 10 cent stores, the three 10 cent stores. Um, Charlie Stearns, men's clothing. Guns, men's clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, Lessers, okay. ladies' clothing. Drug stores? Lesser. Yeah. And it was a very fine family. And of course, the Michael Brothers. And that beautiful building yeah, that they had and there. And the attorneys, the Michael Brothers attorneys. What about, um, was Moon Winds in downtown yes, Athens yes, at the time? Yes, Moon Wind. It was right where, it, uh, when I say right where it is today, I don't know what's there today, but it was there when I was in Georgia. Okay. I was trying to remember, there was some way you could get, I understand, a piece of pound cake for a nickel. And I'm not sure whether it was one of the drug stores you could, you, at the, and you saved your nickels to, to get that that piece of pound cake. Well, you can so. get a hamburger for a dime. <laughs> Let's talk so, about some of your early influences. I know you had two brothers who went to Georgia, right? I had two brothers that went to Georgia. Uh, Joe, who was 12 years my senior, and my other brother was 10 years older than me. And then my sister, Grace. And, and so they were part of what encouraged you to think about the university, right? Ma'am, I never had any idea of anything other than the university. The only you know, place. I, I feel like it's mine. I hear you. <laughs> Me too. How about Coach Howell Hollis? Was he an influence on you? Coach Howell Hollis was one of the greatest influences in my days. He coached me for three years in the Athens High, and he was a, a wonderful gentleman, no question. Uh, and then when I came to Georgia, he was his, his second year as a freshman coach. And my sophomore year, when Coach Butts was working with uh, kickers for use in games, uh, he got through and he said, well, that's all. He said, uh, we'll go ahead with this. And Coach Hollis said, Coach, let Costa try some. So he said, okay, come on over. So I started kicking. And I was very fortunate in that I think I kicked up all for about 15 minutes and didn't miss one. And Coach Bush said, well, he's our kicker. You were looking so good, huh? I, I have Coach Bush, I mean, Coach Hollis to thank. Coach Hollis was one of the best scouts you've ever seen in football. He scouted Tech for the whole year, every year, and we beat him all three years as a varsity. He also did. Did coach? He was golf coach at one yes, point. Yes. And then was he the AD, the athletic director no, at one point? No. Not, not that I know of. Any other early influences that you think of right off the bat? Oh, well, a lot of examples set for us from Mr. Bell, principal of Athens oh, High. Good role models. He was a fantastic gentleman, no question about it. And the general public, it, it, you weren't a stranger to anybody. They all, it, I felt like well, I was uh, Mrs. Whitaker's uh, adopted son. Cause we'd go over there at night to see Henry, and if Henry wasn't there, that's fine. <laughs> Henry was a girl. But uh, Miss Whitaker, we'd visit with her. We just loved to know him. Athens is just a, a, a place that took you in and helped raise you. It took That's a right. village, I think. Is that what it is? That the uh, well, it, it worked that way then. <laughs> sure did. Did you go to Barra School? Did I do what? Barra Elementary School? Yes, yes. We called it Lumpkin Street School. I went there from uh, the fourth grade, the fourth grade and fifth grade. That's where I first ran into McGill. Big oh, Dan. oh, yeah. Dangerous Dan. I went to uh, Chase Street for three years before that. We lived on Boulevard Right. when I was born. Boulevard, the street parallel to Prince Avenue, mm -hmm. street with beautiful old homes. Beautiful Prince old and, homes. and Boulevard. Trees growing over the street, yeah. and it was a wide street. 
you had Chase and Barron, basically, was, uh, and there was Child Street at the same time. Child too. Street. Maybe I those were Child the Street for two years, and junior high. Three elementary. Did Child Street start as the a junior high school? Yeah. Right? Okay. That's, that's where we were. Mr. Upshaw Bentley said he went barefooted to Bear School. Did y'all go to school barefooted? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, for some reason or other, didn't like to go barefooted. <laughs> Stuck my toe. He then asked me if I went to school barefoot. I said, no, sir. By the time I got there, they didn't let us come barefoot. So. <laughs> um, let's go on and let's talk about the University of Georgia days. Oh, boy. What did the campus look like when you started at the University of Georgia? Pretty much, um, well, I say pretty much like it does today. In the old section, uh -huh. down... Uh, academic building on up toward uh, New College and Old College and the building next to the Old College which was a library at that time. Um, they, they were just nice as they could be. Uh, CJ building was okay. where the journalism and commerce uh, classes were held and they had just completed the uh, new law school. Hershall. Yeah. Right. Was the beanery there then? Oh yeah, the beanery was there. Was that in Old Denmark Hall, which is it sort was of down behind uh, CJ Building? Right. Mm -hmm. Tell us what the beanery was. Well, the beanery, I, would, I never went to the beanery. But, you knew uh, better. Huh? Oh, I well, <laughs> <laughs> I think um, Pistol Jenkins, Professor right. Jenkins. Uh -huh. I think he ran the beanery, didn't he? I, I'm not sure who ran it. I just remember that it was a place, it was just an eating place, yeah. sort of a, a place on campus. And, mm -hmm. and I was never in there. There was, was a, The uh, language building was relatively new, okay. and Lacan Hall was uh, very new, and the fine arts art building across from Joe Brown, uh, it was brand new because I worked on the basement of that place uh, during that the right? summer. I think of 1940. Now, was the military military building was right right there. next door? Yeah. And then the the um, tennis courts. Where would have fall? Right. Was the the where did the cavalry the, have their exercises? Was it right behind the military? Right behind the military building, down in the parking lot. Used to be the parking lot for the bookstore. Right. Uh, of recent years, but I think there's a building there now. That's right. That's right. <laughs> a couple of new buildings down there. So oh. it's cha it has changed, and it has yeah. grown out towards Watkinsville. Watkinsville better look out, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> what um, what memorable folks do you remember from that day? From the faculty, the staff, who had? Oh, we had some great professors. Uh, one that were will always remain in my mind because of his fairness and his teaching abilities. Uh, that was, uh, had a nickname of Egghead, but it was Edwin. Um, let's see, um, I, I knew this was going to happen. You, you can, me. I'm happy for you to check your notes because okay. I'm you certainly using mine. Um, he was, he was a great, great professor. No question about it. As a matter of fact, during football season, he had uh, the group write a term paper, and he offered to let me read a book and make a verbal report on it. And you know what? I didn't read the book. You wrote your paper, didn't you? No, I didn't write the paper. <laughs> <laughs> and I took another course on him the next year. and made the best grade I made while I was in Georgia. And it was all on uh, controlling funds, controlling money. Which is what you ended up doing, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. That's what you, that, that may um, have helped you find out what you, what you wanted to do with your life. Well, I really didn't want to do it, but that's just what I wound up doing. Griffin? Griffin. Griffin. Yeah, Egghead Griffin. Egghead Griffin. Well, yeah, you know, Ed, I, in, in one Pandora, they have his name listed as Edwin, and in another Pandora, they have his name listed as e Edward. Well, now, was it Egghead because he was smart, or was it Egghead because his head looked like an egg? No, no he, was, he was brilliant. He really fellow. was. And, of course, there was uh, Dr. Sutton, mm -hmm. and um, 
Heckman, Dr. Heckman. And these folks were all in the College of Business, right? Yeah, right. Um, it, it's funny Dr. to me. Dr. Waters in um, Human Biology, Dr. Everett in uh, uh, Literature. That's Ed Everett? Mm hmm. They were great. I, I, I'm glad them. to know they all had real names because everybody that's talked to us has talked about Pistol Jenkins and ABC <laughs> McPherson. I thought they all had nicknames. It's good that they've got real names. <laughs> What about Dean Tate? Did you run into Dean Tate much? Oh, I'm afraid I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the Dean list every now and then. <laughs> Mr. Costa, would you come up to see Dean Tate? <laughs> hey, talk about Dean Tate a little bit for us. We're trying to collect some well, I, anecdotes about him. I was him. a Chi Phi at Georgia, and you know where the house was I on Lumpkin Street. When Dean Tate had an occasion to Walked past the house, he walked by with his arms up and down like that. <laughs> like I'm not armed, don't shoot me. <laughs> but he was, he was fantastic. He was a great English teacher too. He's also one of those smart, oh, yes. kind of folks. So. Oh yes, you, I, lo I love those little glasses that he wore. You know, you talked about the fact of, of a fair teacher and I think Dean Tate was one of those people that people remember as he would get you good when you need to be got. Yeah. But he also would help give you a hand and help you up. He really did. He, so, he, was, he was great. Dean Tate. Where did you live? Did you live at home? Yeah, sure did. On Millage Heights. And where did the football team live? Uh, football team at the time lived in the dormitory on Lumpkin Street, um, right behind where the baseball diamond used to be. Candela? Did they live no, in Candela? No, no, they live in Candela. This was down at the bottom of the Clark Lincoln. Howell? Yeah. Clark Howell. And then they uh, moved over to uh, the one over um, behind Memorial Hall. Payne Hall. Payne Hall. Payne Hall. <laughs> Charlie Trippy talked about never go to a school where you have a dormitory right next to the stadium because they will end up making you practice at night. You turn the lights on. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> Oh, me. Charlie is something else. What a fine gentleman. You're right. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about that in a Good. little while. So, Talk about that social scene. Chi Phi House. What was the social life on campus like? Fantastic. Uh, dances uh, every weekend, it seemed like. The students didn't want to go home over the weekend. They wanted to stay here. Now the roads are full of them on Saturdays, Fridays. Where, where the action was, was right That's here in right. Athens. The dances at Woodruff Hall. Talk about Woodruff Hall a little bit. It's uh, It was <laughs> a strange place. That was where the basketball court was, of course. And as, as uh, Coach Rupp from Kentucky said, it's the only place you have to worry about windage when you shoot a basket. <laughs> <laughs> And of course it would rain, rain in, in a little some. bit. Oh yeah, but it was a, and of course playing basketball on a court that has just had powdered wax thrown <laughs> on it for a dance is not the best idea in the world. Break your neck. That's right. Um, little commencement. Little commencement. Was that the big weekend in the spring? Oh man, that was fantastic. We had Tommy Dorsey uh -huh. and. Uh, Spivak and some others of that caliber. All the big bands. Oh, we just loved it no end. Of course, have four dances, have a, a dance on Friday night, have a, a dance early Saturday morning, a tea dance of that afternoon, and then the dance uh, Saturday night. Well, now, did you take a different girl to every one? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's an unfair question. <laughs> Ms. Joanna Stegman Trailer said, uh, I said, now I understand it. You, you, it was not the thing just to dance with the same fellow the whole time. And she said, you tried not to if you could help it. So, <laughs> In other words, what you call stuck. <laughs> so even if you took the same girl, she got to dance with some other fellows. Oh, Is yes. that right? Oh, yes. Okay. That's for sure. How about homecoming? Was it the same type weekend or did y'all have the same kind of? It was, but of course, we didn't have too much opportunity to uh, enter into that. Playing because, ball, weren't yeah, you? Yeah. Sure were. But it was pretty much the same thing. 
How'd you get around? Daddy's car, my father's car, and of course, Peter Trousdale and his four-door convertible Ford, and um, fraternity brothers with cars. You had lots of friends when you had a car, didn't you? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes you did. You know, it, it, the wonderful old pictures of folks who are hitchhiking, on the standing waiting, mostly girls, girls standing on the side of the ro road waiting to get a lift, and, and, and I guess that's what happened, and, and those were the days when you were comfortable when a townsperson picked you up. And that's right. Of course, it, the girls from going to college that had to come into town, that's the way they had to get in. Well, do no we have buses bus running? No. No bus service in no. Athens at that time? Not in those days. Why did they put coordinate college, why did they put the first two years, women of the, uh, the co-eds from the first two years of school on coordinate college? Uh, well, of course, that had been uh, the uh, teacher's college at one time. Right. Uh, in fact, my wife's mother went there for one quarter, and all she said she did was to chase butterflies. <laughs> so she was at the normal school and chased she butterflies. Was, yeah, that's right. <laughs> was it to... Uh, Women, so, did junior and senior women live on campus, and freshmen and sophomore women lived uh, at Coordinate? The freshmen and sophomores lived uh, there. Out there. Of course, the, the girls lived uh, on Village Avenue in Lucy so, Cobb. That's right. Okay. A lot of them did. I, I'm sure you all were able to find a way to get together, though, right? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm we, we, <laughs> we managed somehow. <laughs> um, Let's talk a little football. A little football. Let's talk about Coach Butts. Describe Coach him. Butts. Describe him for us. If you, if you, if there was somebody who'd never met Coach Butts, how would you describe him? The little round man. Mm -hmm. um, Coach Butts was a fine gentleman. There's no question of that. Uh, had an awful lot of pressure on him to win, and of course he he did that for quite some time. Um, he was a tough taskmaster because that's what he did to himself. Uh, when he was playing college football, he would work on Saturday morning uh, at Ma in Macon at Mercer and um, would then get, go to the football game, um, go to the stadium and get dressed to play that day. And he just couldn't understand somebody not paying the price which was one of his favorite expressions, to get to be good. Had to work at it. Had to no work gain. Worth at it. Yeah. No pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. You absolutely. You've talked to him. <laughs> I actually knew Coach Butts when I was a little bit younger. Well, did I tell him the truth? Yes, sir. I didn't ever play football for him, but I, I understand what you mean. I, I think the idea was that what a gentleman when he was off the field and when he was oh, on yeah. the field, a tough, tough. It was that fella. There were some other coaches that you uh, that that were uh, coaching when you were in school, oh, and yeah. Coach, Coach J.B. Whitworth. J.B. Whitworth. Ears. Ears Whitworth. He's the one that taught me to keep my head down. I want you to tell that story. <sighs> it's no story. It's <laughs> the truth. <laughs> he was down at the other end of the field, and I was kicking from about the 30-yard line, which I normally didn't do. And uh, he happened to be looking up that way, and I had kicked one, and he hollered up, said, was that one good? And I said, yes, sir. He said, all right, get on the track. So I got on the track. The quarter mile track was right there, because the track field was right by the baseball park where we practiced. And Coach Butts called everybody into the huddle. So I very graciously came off the field and went over to the huddle. And Coach Whitworth said, not you, Costa. I said, get back out there on that track. So I got on the track and I got off of it when it's six o'clock rolled around. I lost 16 pounds that afternoon and almost got run over in Lumpkin Street that night from parking across the street from the house and getting out of the car and starting to cross and getting cramps in the yeah, back yeah. of both of my legs and couldn't move. Why had he sent you uh, to, to walk on the track? I was looking up. You looked up to see if the ball would look up. So he said, from now on, so you pick up a silver dollar off the ground, which actually meant a blade of grass. 
And when I kicked the ball, I would pick up that blade of grass. I didn't look. Believe me, I did don't you, get on that track Did you again. ever see another one? Did you ever see he another? said you can see the last one your last year downhill. And I did. So the last kick you kicked? In the Rose Bowl. Who else coached for you all during those years? Coach Sykes. Uh, he was the end coach, and he left Georgia and went to Kansas as head coach at Kansas. And took Cliff Kimsey, mm -hmm. who was the year before us, um, out as an assistant coach. And I happened to be in, working in Dallas at the time, so I got to see them out there. I saw them play TCU. Um, and of course, there was Elma Lampy, who was uh, backfield, that's not, not backfield coach, that was Hartman. Uh, Elma Lampy uh, coached the defense, and he also coached basketball team. Because, you know, in those days, coaches. Multitasking, huh? Yeah. Yeah, they coached different ones. And then, of course, there was uh, Lumpkin and Hartman and Hollis. And they were terrific, all of them. Well, y'all had great teams during those years, too. Well, it was due to Coach Bucks, really. Well, I, I read somewhere that he decided you were too valuable to let you scrimmage, so you spent your time trotting around the well, and, practicing and, and practicing kicking, practicing is that right? Practicing kicking, yeah. Well, he figured that if I played, I would be third string at best. <laughs> and. Um, I would be better off just doing what I was doing. But spring practice now, that didn't hold true. So you got to oh, knock heads with the rest of them. you got to scrimmage with them. Mr. Trippy also said that Coach Butts felt like it, if you could play offense, you also had to play defense. So well, they had no choice. Uh, in, 40, in 1940, uh, if you went into a game in the quarter, uh, you were there until the end of the quarter with no substitution. Uh, Is that right? Yeah, there was no substitution. You could go in only once a quarter. So my sophomore year, if we scored two touchdowns in one quarter, I could only kick one of them. Huh. And one of the players in sync, which was a marvelous kicker. Mm -hmm. um, so he could do that with no problem. Was not aware but of can that. you imagine him Putting me in for a sandwich and me <laughs> <laughs> and the sandwich not being able to go back. Well, I know Coach McGill called you Leo the Lionhearted, so you would you would be out there roaring. I know if you could. Oh so. yeah, it was it was fun. You scored against every team that we played during your three year career. Yep. Scoring Quite every, a record. Every scoring every game for four years, including the freshman years. Quite a record. Well, in I was very fortunate in that I never missed a goal that ended in a win for Georgia or at least a tie for Georgia. Like my sophomore year against Kentucky, they had scored and kicked the extra point. We scored uh, and I, it was late in the fourth quarter and I kicked the extra point and tied the ball game. Then against Auburn, uh, we beat Auburn 14 to 13, and we beat Tech 21 to 19. Whew. So the extra points you, you were know, the hero. Counted. You were the hero. Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was Sequich and Trippy and Davis. And there was another quote I saw somewhere where it said Coach Butts turned to somebody when you went out to kick one of those and said, "I wouldn't be in Costa's shoes for all the money in the world." I heard he said that. He never told me that. <laughs> <laughs> cool and calm. You all went to the Orange Bowl in January of 42 and then uh, had a 10-1 season, uh, the 1942 season, 10-1, losing only to Alabama. Mm -hmm. What happened at Alabama? We didn't lose to Alabama. We beat Alabama. We lost to Auburn. Okay. What, what happened at Auburn? We had just beaten Florida 75 to nothing. We were and, worn out from running up and down the field. And Florida had beaten Auburn earlier in the season. Auburn kicked off to us, and we scored in, I guess, less than five minutes. Just bang, 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 going down for a touchdown. And everybody says, oh, good gosh, another, another Florida game. 
Well, it was almost. <laughs> Just the opposite, though. I didn't turn out well, that way. Well, you got down, you lost your edge, and frequently you can't get it back. We really can see what spirit and motivation does looking at that uh, Auburn game last year with the oh, black yes, shirts. It's right. amazing what difference it makes. That's right. It? And, of course, th that 10-1, uh, and one, we played Kentucky in Kentucky, and we was you know, supposed to win by a good margin. Well, they were leading six to nothing late in the fourth quarter, and we scored, and I kicked the extra point, and we won that game. But it like to scared me to death because as I was kicking, my right foot hit my heel of my left foot where it was planted, and I thought I had missed it. And I told Davis, I said, oh, Lord, Davis, I missed it. He said, no, you didn't. So I turned from where I was headed to the Kentucky <laughs> bench and came back to the Georgia <laughs> bench. <laughs> uh, and Lamar Davis was your holder? Yes, best you've ever seen. Had great hands, put it right in the right place every Absolutely. Time. And he used to just absolute irritate Andy Dudish so that he couldn't stand it because I couldn't hit one with Andy Dudish holding for me <laughs> to save my life. And I think that was mental. Let's talk about the game, the 1943 yeah. Rose Bowl. Um, there's a wonderful film. Do we know who shot that film? Of the if I had to guess, I would say Buster Birdsong, but I wouldn't swear to that at all. It's a wonderful film that, that uh, takes in many of the high points of the trip uh, out and back. And well, there had to be somebody that went out with us, but I don't remember whether Buster was in the service at that time or not. I don't remember. You travel by train. Talk to us from beginning, from the the train on what where did you get on the train we got on the train in athens okay and what and, and, and was it was, the silver comet was that the one you got i don't on? think it was we we, we changed uh, locomotives in uh in my yard in atlanta mm -hmm. so i don't know what the name of the train was but my wife was trying to get on the train to go down to south georgia and the trains were so packed that she couldn't get on. Two of them went through. And the station man told her, said, if you are going to get to Atlanta on the train, you better get on this train. And she got on the train with, with me. <laughs> well, the train no longer, no, no uh, sooner gotten started when uh, Coach Whitworth comes up to me. And he says, Costa, I said, what's that lady doing on the train with you? <laughs> she, she's not going to California. <laughs> I said, no, sir. I said, they told her if she wanted to get to Atlanta, she better get on. So she did, and they let her off in Inman Yard with one of the trainers that uh, wasn't going out to California. And the, the train, the Inman Yard was just run over with people and she got a ride into the station so she could get down to South Georgia. Get, get home. And then we left. Now, did it was just the team? I'm sure they were. Who traveled with you? The we had two cars, and they had to be a good number of berths used by other people. I don't know what, because a scrubs slept two to a berth <laughs> in the lowers, and the stars slept in the uppers alone. <laughs> and of course, before. Uh, we slept in the uppers, and the stars slept in the lowers, but not in this case. And can you imagine? I can't imagine. Oh, it, <laughs> for you, four days. You were not rested then when you arrived. No, and we got to the train station, and no showers for four days, two meals a day, because they didn't want us to get fat. <laughs> <laughs> and. We get to the hotel, the Huntington Hotel in Pasadena, and everybody gets a key and starts heading for the room. And before we can even get there, they round us up and have a meeting. And we're told that we're there to win the ball game. And if you think you're here for anything else, come see me when this meeting's <laughs> over and I'll give you a fail back to Georgia. <laughs> Wanted you to understand what it was about. Right. So. And we did. We practiced two a day. Is that right? Yes, we were out there before before Christmas. Where did you practice? Not at the stadium. Out at uh, Caltech. Okay. 
Well, in the film, there's a beautiful old building. Is that the hotel where you stay? Yeah, the Hunt right. Hunt beautiful Hunt. hotel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting to see. With well, all I know the fruit trees out yeah. and all. In January mm -hmm. or December. Y'all got out there at the end we of the... We got out there about December the 22nd or 21st, 22nd. So you spent Christmas in oh, yes. California. Right. And it took four days cross country. Right. Two to a birth. Mm-mm-mm. -mm. <laughs> you were greeted and hosted by many, many celebrities and right. folks when you got to California. Talk a little bit about I saw pic I saw Spencer Tracy and Betty Gravel and Bob. Spencer Hope. Tracy, I think, is the first one that shows up on that. That's right. And um, Betty Grable, uh, Dick Richardson, an attorney from Savannah, he was a tackle at this time, a freshman tackle on the team. Uh, somehow or another, um, they they got together. <laughs> Is that right? Oh yeah, it was it was as nice as it could be. Dick was a good looking boy, really. Did w talk about how the events were. Did they invite you all to a lunch, or did you go somewhere for a party or reception? Oh how did yes, we went to uh, Paramount Studios. And if I'm not mistaken, the gentleman in charge of the studios at that time was a tech graduate. But uh, they were delightful to us. We had a luncheon out there, and they ran the stars out to meet us, Susan Hayworth and uh, Alan Ladd, and um, oh, just any number of them. I heard Alan Ladd wasn't but five feet tall. Oh, yeah, Alan was. And Mickey Rooney well, wasn't five feet tall. As a matter of fact, Bill Godwin reached over and picked Mickey Rooney up by his <laughs> shirt call one day. <laughs> Just held him up there. Spencer Tracy, Betty Grable, Bob Hope, William Bendix. Yeah, uh, William Bendix was there. I had uh, a program uh, of the luncheon uh, autographed by all of those people, and it was sold at uh, the uh, silent auction at the function that they have here after the season is over. And uh, the program autographed by all but two of the players and that uh, autograph thing brought about $4,500. That's to the wonderful. Program. Wonderful. We didn't get it for the library, huh? <laughs> <laughs> How about Rita Hayworth? Rita Hayworth. As I said, Rita Hayworth was on the Super Chief and um, two of the players found out that she was on there, and uh, they went over and forcefully were introduced to her. I, I saw in the film it looked like she was signing some autographs. Oh yeah, she was. She came out to the hotel because that was um, that happened in Albuquerque. Is that right? Yeah, where they first met Susan, and um, she came out to the hotel to show that there was no hard feelings of any kind. She looked like there were no hard feelings. <laughs> Did I see Bing Crosby? No, we didn't see Crosby. There um, was a, there Kay was Kaiser. And as a matter of fact, you'll see Kay Kaiser in the film. Oh, Maybe that was who it was. Does he, he Dancing back and forth on the thing, throwing his head on the ground right. and picking it up. Now he's That's Kay Georgia. Kaiser. He's from the state of Georgia, isn't he? Uh, Kay in Kaiser? North Carolina. Okay. I, I, think. Had, I, thought I think he, he went to North Carolina. He was very, very nice young man. Mr. Trippy told us that y'all went to Earl Carroll's. Is we that did. right? We did. We sure did. I did a little research on Earl Carroll's. You did. It sounded like there were a lot of beautiful women with not much clothes on. Is that what that was? Well, I tell you what, I was so much in love at that time. Oh. That I would let the record show that Miss Costa is in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I would much rather have been with her. But now I don't remember any nudity of any kind. He didn't say nudity. In fact, Mr. Trippy didn't say anything. I was the one that... Uh, Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> it trapped, trapped me like Get that. Get you in, in trouble. Well, the, f the film showed the streets of L.A., Grauman's Chinese, and, right. and it, was, uh, it did a wonderful job. And then it showed the game. Let's talk about the game a little bit. Um, let, me, let me make a, a, a statement before it starts. Okay. 
Trippy told me not too long ago that he talked to Coach Butts one day after he came back and was coaching for Coach Butts. And he asked Coach Butts, says, why don't we kick more field goals? And uh, Coach Butts said, well, you can't win ball games with field goals. He said, I want, I want touchdowns. If I can't get a touchdown, I want to leave them way down there so they have a long way to go to score on me. But in this ball game, the score would have never been nine to nothing with a kicker like Kutu that we've got or had. Uh, it would have been at least 27 to, oh, I would say about nine. I would agree after we seeing would, that film. We would have kicked field goals all afternoon long. We were down on the goal line. We fumbled on the goal line one time. It looked like to me that you all moved the ball. I think it was 25 first downs. and to the, and five. To, yes. You ran up and down the field all day. That's right. That's an interesting philosophy. What would yeah. you, I mean. Well, we kicked, we, we kicked one field goal the whole time I was to Georgia, and Sinkwich kicked it, and he called the play in the huddle on the field, and Kimsey told him, that was a, uh, Kimsey's senior year, Kimsey told him, says, Coach Bush gonna kill you. <laughs> <laughs> called his field goal, and Frank kicked it and made it. it that was an interesting philosophy, no, no field goal, so. You uh, you were playing in Rose Bowl Stadium, which of course is the home stadium for the for team UCLA. that you for the team that you were playing, yeah, the Bruins. Right. So they had that advantage, and ninety three thousand people in attendance. They have biggest, right. I mean, huge crowd. We we don't seat ninety three yet, do we? We're ninety two something here, Co close. Right at ninety three. Um, so so y'all were ten and one. That's right. Excuse me, us we. We. The, the dogs were ten and one, and the Bruins were seven and three. Um, describe what it feels like to walk on the field at the Rose Bowl. Well, you drive up to the Rose Bowl, and you have no idea that it's as large as it is, if you haven't seen it before, um, because it is down in a hole, and where you see those uh, tubes entering into the stadium, uh, that's ground level outside. So, yeah, it's down in there. And of course, the seats are well uh, balanced out on, you know, as far as being able to see. Um, the, the field was a great field. This film shows the uh, grass is being burnt and all that, but I don't remember that at all. I remember it as being a, a beautiful green like we have at Sanford Stadium. As a matter of fact, I thought it was uh, equal to Sanford Stadium or the Cotton Bowl, either one, as far as the field is concerned. So beautiful physical facility. Yes. All those fans and even the film captured some of the of the that flashcard yeah, right. business choreography, which is just amazing. Of course, we we didn't have too many fans out there. Right. <laughs> Couldn't get there. That's right. Unless they were already there in the service. Did you know they had played the Rose Bowl the year before in North Carolina? At Duke, did At Duke. Concern about the, I guess, the Japanese. Well, they had had some bombs floated over that did uh, detonate up in uh, the northwestern states. But we were more comfortable by this time. Well, as a matter of fact, they didn't even have the Rose Bowl parade. In, in, when you all yeah. went, mm -hmm. is that right? They didn't have the parade. Concern for safety then? Did you know about the Rose Bowl? It started in 1903, and they had a football game that year. And then the next few years, up to 1915, they had chariot races. Is that yeah. right? That's right. Like in Ben-Hur? Yeah. <laughs> Those folks in California. <laughs> um. I know that in this game, Mr. Sinkwich was injured. Uh, not injured in the game, I'm sorry, but came with He a left Athens with uh, one ankle, uh, Achilles tendon, and got the other one hurt out there in a scrimmage 
both totally unnecessary, tackled out of bounds in both cases by the same player. Whose name will not be mentioned? You don't want to know that. All right, good. <laughs> Uh, and, and he was he, he was not a regular by any stretch. So we knew better than that, Frank head <laughs> on. <laughs> but um, Charlie had to play a lot of football that day and had a breakout game, didn't he? He did. I never will forget his first punt. Um, Bob Waterfield had punted, and it was a terrific punt, and the stands just thought it was great and really applauded him wholeheartedly. And then we had to punt, and Trippy kicked one at least 15 yards longer than <laughs> Waterfield had, and they went nuts. He, he played a magnificent game. He said what he, he did all season. He, uh, I, I, he's, I, he's on the all-time Rose Bowl team. I think I read that he was voted Rose Bowl MVP retroactively. Yep. Yeah. In 1953, they evidently went back and, and did that. So he had a breakout game. I think I, the record I saw was 130 yards and something like 25 carries. So, yeah. but in the film, you can see we are we move up and down the field almost at will. We just don't cross the goal line until the fourth quarter. Talk to us about is it Willard Bo Willard Willard Boyd. Boyd Red Boyd. In those days, you pointed punted from 15 yards back, excuse me, 10 yards back from the line of scrimmage, as opposed to 15 yards to date. And why more punts weren't blocked, I don't know. But uh, it wasn't, wasn't a customary thing. But uh, you snap the ball back 10 yards, it's a good, good size snap. Mm -hmm. But at the time, we couldn't pick the ball up and throw it like they do now. We had to drag it along the ground and snap it. So 15 yards would have been a real push for those days. But, uh, and they kicked with one step, and today they kick almost at the line of scrimmage from 15 yards back. But it was. Um, so he blocked he Bob blocked, Waterfield's he, punt. He blocked Waterfield's punt and out of bounds. They knocked it out of the end zone which of course gave us two points. Second. Had we recovered it in the end zone, it would have been a touchdown. Okay, so we had a safety day, and this was at the beginning, first part of the fourth quarter, right? It was, yeah, it was in the fourth quarter. And then, tell us about that last um, score. Clyde Earhart intercepted a pass and made a nice run of it back to say around the 20 yard line. And then uh, Trippy uh, got it down to close it to the goal line, and he put Sinkwich back in, and put Sinkwich in at fullback. And uh, Frank got it across, and I mean, he just did get it across, believe me, he did. But it, it was a touchdown. So the score then was eight to nothing, and I kicked the extra point and it made it nine. And the, effect, the announcer was inebriated and there was a penalty on the kick. They were all sides, and they gave us a choice of kicking again or taking the point. So he, he announces over the television, I mean over the TV, excuse me, over the radio, radio that uh, UCLA was uh, penalized the point, that the kick was no good, that, uh, that, but they gave us a point because of their penalty. And you can't penalize anybody a point in football. He was inebriated. He was. <laughs> what was the most memorable moment on, in that trip? Lots of memorable moments. Huh? For me, the most memorable part in that trip was pulling into Athens. <laughs> you were ready to get home, huh? I was ready to get back to her. I, I hear you. Miss Costa is going to have to give you a big dinner this Sunday. That's how fine I know. <laughs> Ma'am, she's taken care of me for 65 years. Uh, well, that's great. I think so. Well, after the university, you uh, married Carolyn Harris of Leesburg, Georgia. Sure did. We have a copy of your wedding announcement. Amazing enough, amazingly enough, the, acad uh, the, uh, the uh, Alumni Association has 
How about that? All uh, saves up things. Uh, Great. So we have your wedding, wedding announcement. And then you went in the service, is that right? Right. Where'd you serve? Jackson, Mississippi. Spent the war in Jackson, Spent Mississippi. Spent the war in Jackson, Mississippi. Well, some people would call that tough duty, but I think well, that's not such a... Um, I tell you what, well, it's like my friend Bill Bruckner said, nobody, you don't hear about the uh, Russians or the Japanese or anybody coming in since, into Chicago uh, during the war. So you can see I did a good job you did, to keep them out. Uh, we had the Dutch at uh, Jackson when I got there. And when they had a group of American officers that uh, got along well with the Dutch, they, they kept us there. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I coached uh, the Air Base football team and played, and we played and beat Harry Mayer at Ole Miss. <laughs> and that was, a good thing. that was a good thing. <laughs> that was a good time. But Jackson was a wonderful town. We loved it. We really did. So tell us what happened after that, your career, and talk a little bit about your family. Uh, well, I was called back into service in Korea, but uh, they weren't taking any limited service uh, uh, officers. And the reason for my limited service was the fact that my, my right eye is 2400, uh, not correctable. And they, as an officer, you can't. Uh, go into action in any way that way. Of course, running a PX and coaching football is not exactly a lot of action. Um, you're in Atlanta now? Mm -hmm. Been there since 52. But I'm still from Athens. I hear you. Talk a little bit about Ms. Costa and, and I, I, though I think you've done a very good job of that <laughs> already. Talk a little bit about your family. She, Carolyn taught school in uh, DeKalb County. Uh, first uh, first work that she did was with uh, Peach, well not Peach Street, uh, Overthorpe Presbyterian. She was head of the uh, kindergarten program there mm -hmm. for 18 years. And then she left and went with uh, DeKalb County and worked as a paraprofessional mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, kindergarten, with kindergarten. And she retired from that. We both retired at the same time in 1987, and have had just one wonderful time ever Been since. Loving life. With the with the Phelpses, uh, traveling to Europe from '87 to 1998 was just terrific. We have had a wonderful time. Well, that's, that's, Couldn't be better. I can't what, imagine anybody having a greater time or a greater marriage. That's what you want. You want that retirement and 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 right. to be a wonderful time to spend some time together. Yes, ma'am. Does anybody have any question they would like to? I have two. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, again, for the record, sir, can you tell me what years you played football at Georgia? I was a freshman in 1939, and uh, varsity 40, 41, 42. Okay, and if you would tell Fran, please, we're not sure who shot the film, but how is it that it came to your possession, sir? Oh, uh, Can you talk to Fran, the, tell her that story? the uh, athletic department uh, gave us that. Uh, I also have a film from the um, Orange Bowl, but it is just of the game. Right. It had no none of the uh, personal things that the Rose Bowl ta tape has. So the athletic department gave you yes. the Rose Bowl film. Mm -hmm. And to your knowledge, sir, was was did somebody shoot this film? Then they just made copies for everybody, like a keepsake? Is that how it I'm works? sure. Okay. Mr. Costa, this has been a real pleasure. Uh, I enjoyed it. To, I didn't uh, think I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> to have you with fact, us today. I've been plotting <laughs> revenge. How to get out of this, huh? <laughs> it's been a real pleasure to have you with us today. And I've enjoyed it, it no end. He said I would. <laughs> well, he was right. So well, He usually is. <laughs> We're glad you'd come and, and talk to us today and, and, and the things that you've uh, uh, imparted to us today will be things that folks will go back later and, and uh, for scholarly reasons or just for fun. Scholar. <laughs> <laughs> or just for fun, take a look. And we That's are, uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you.